Tonight we welcome State Fault back to the stage of the Phoenix Theater. When last we met on this show in 2015, State Faults was winding down and getting ready for the next chapters of their life. It is now 2019 and State Faults is back. Much has changed for them personally and in the world around them. And tonight we'll go deep into those things and later they'll play a set of music. Please welcome to the program, Johnny Michael Jared, the trio known as State Faults. Thank you. Yo. Thank you. Thanks. It's We're now here. 2019. Yeah, Jesus. Here we Much are. Here has we are. changed. Mm-hmm. A lot. Yeah. We're a lot of years older and a lot of years uglier. <laughs> and, uh, except me. Yeah, you look great. Always. I age like fine wine. <laughs> Thank you for taking the lead on that. I was going to start with you, Johnny. All right. <laughs> you, you are, uh, Is you are a Chardonnay. You <laughs> are. <laughs> is yes. it a Chardonnay? Yeah, good. <laughs> you are you are nearly thirty now. I'm nearly thirty. You're nearly thirty now. Star- staring down the barrel of a, of a forty five, but it's a thirty actually. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ready to blow your brains out, and I feel <laughs> like splatter against the wall. I feel like the last four years have been some of the greatest period of growth and change for you in your entire adult life. Would you agree with that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I definitely feel a lot different. It's actually weird. Lately, I felt a real disconnect from like my past self and I don't know where exactly it happens, but like, I feel like I have kind of switched a lot. Can we talk about how 2015 Johnny was different from 2019 (laughs) Johnny? We can all (laughs) jump in. So different. I mean, I mean, obviously you're still the same person, Yeah, but I mean, when you look at who you were at the last incarnation of this band and now, yeah, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Very wild. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah. You know, I would say just as a spoiler alert, if you're just going to listen to the first three minutes of this episode and you want to know what the crux of it is, two of these people have become men. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of putting it. And yeah. one is our beautiful baby boy. It's still a boy. <laughs> so let's start with this man. What What is the difference between this old sense of <clears throat> self that you, you feel so disconnected from? Um, I think it's definitely just self-confidence and a uh, sense of purpose now more in my life than I did before. Uh, back in 2015, we were all pretty burnt out. And I think some of us were filled with a lot of anxieties and fear of moving forward, like as a serious band and all the you know, the stressful stuff that comes with that financially and like being, you know, everywhere and on the road. And we kind of just like, uh, stopped having fun and, uh, yeah, now four years have passed and gotten married. I've gotten married to a partner that is like full force, a hundred percent behind the dream of state faults and behind me and ready to give me all the love and support I need and have has given me a platform for me to fully realize myself I think she's a she's kind of like a weird cosmic mirror I guess well cosmic calvert yeah that's what we call her yeah yeah I think that was her handle but it's not anymore you know here's (laughs) the thing um uh, if you have more to say on that, please, please say it. But I, I just want to say it's like somebody might see this and be like, why is State Falls back? Like, why does a band need to come back on this show? They've already <laughs> done it once. Well, when last we started an episode with State Faults, the other time, we were talking about the first time you uh, had sex. Oh, yeah. And it was in a garage <laughs> on a Porsche. And we were all... It wasn't the we first all, time, well, but it was one of the wildest times. It was the coolest time. Time. I it was One of the boring. coolest times. It was good. There was like... And uh, being 17 and still living at home... And trying to get any chance you can get at intimacy, we decided to go into this garage thinking she didn't see us. And I guess she totally saw us. <laughs> and um, we proceeded to uh, <laughs> to make love <laughs> on the hood of this Porsche. Yeah, that was the best. And um, <laughs> Not anymore. And how you defiled the, the car and all that. All right. And we were all giggling like little schoolboys. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, life was so much different then. Yeah. I feel like a certain thing happens in your late 20s you know at least it did for me and i feel like i've recognized i mean i'm not much older than these guys but i feel like i can see it jared's 56 years old in both of them and especially johnny because our lives 
you know, we both got married, so... You're the other person that became a man at this time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. We're both men now. <laughs> and um, I, I don't know, I could because I feel similarly about that in that it was kind of a really transitory period since we were on the podcast last. Um, but definitely, like, I don't know, something about going into your late 20s, that transition, I think it's between, like, 25 and 30, but I think I definitely kind of everything kind of converged around, you know, when I was like 27 or 28, where just a lot of things around me were changing. A lot of, you know, my family dynamic was changing, but just, I feel like something in, it's like almost like in, in my, you know, my brain chemistry, it kind of like you you feel like you're kind of, it's, it's cliche, but it's like, <laughs> you're starting a new chapter. You're like walking through a door. We chemists now. And mm -hmm. you can see your past self and you, but it's it's not you feel a little less connected i guess to that person and everything kind of just uh feels new like i feel like a new version of myself with more clarity because i feel like when you all started state faults which was about what year 2010 2010, 2010. and yeah. then you were on this show in 2015 and now it's 2019 i feel like in 2010 and you know we've all like known people who've gone through this trajectory uh life was fun life was innocent there wasn't a lot that was serious yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you know uh -huh. we, we made a lot of jokes we shouldn't have made and what fun that was <laughs> and um yeah. oh definitely you know and, and then in 2015 i think like a sense of desperation was setting in yeah sort of like wait a minute we're still doing this yeah and, yeah and, and, oh, where, definitely. and where am mm -hmm. i going and why am i doing this yeah and I, I feel yeah. like you addressed a lot of that between then and now. Yeah. I mean, we started Slow Bloom, which was uh, more or less our way of just like, forget everything, forget any pressure of being on a label or like doing any tours or whatever. Let's just make really fun music. I mean, we were all feeling pretty burnt out and just kind of like, where where do we go? And I think age had a lot to do with it too. We were all kind of, I mean, like I said, that kind of, that age that you get at where real life kicks in adult life kicks in you have to fend for yourself you kind of realize we're not kids anymore uh, a lot of the choices that we made in the band up until that point started to have consequence i mean you go on tour and you come back and you're broke and you're like oh yeah i have to make oh, yeah. money i'm broke i can't tour for a while now <laughs> yeah. because i'm yeah. broke yeah well, and also I think having a band kind of delays that. I think that if you don't have like a fun project that distracts you and you have this like this idea like, well, yeah, I mean, obviously we're going to do right. this and we'll, we'll probably be successful enough to just right. do this. That kind of delays the impact of being the, in a band is prolonged childhood. It's pro That's, prolonged adolescence. That's exactly what sure. I'm talking about. Yeah. And then um, going on tours, like going to camp and it's just, <laughs> it's just a bunch of boys or a bunch of for us, it was a bunch of boys. I just think the relationship aspect that happened in the intervening years years is fascinating because you, you all you all three come from different backgrounds you know what i mean yeah. like I, I know a little bit of all of your backgrounds and all that and jared probably less so but i mean it, it's like uh you know johnny you you come from a family that has some you know religious overtones yeah it, you know and yeah. that that was that was a thing and i feel like some of your you know development growing up and like perhaps the desire to be a little more outlandish, perhaps the <laughs> desire to be a little louder, to oh, be yeah. a little more Definitely. mischievous, kind of comes from that. Oh, for sure. You know, yeah. and, and, and Jared, I, I think we've talked a little bit about your, your life a little bit, but I feel mm -hmm. like, there, you know, there was some like rocky stuff or whatever. Yeah. And it's like the desire to like, you know, build a family that is like solid and right. that is like, and can be like looked at as a foundation, like that has informed the adult that you've oh, become. Oh yeah, well, and the religious stuff. I mean, I related to Johnny early on because we both come from very religious upbringings you know i think my parents later on were less religious I, they're less religious overall than i think johnny's parents i mean johnny's parents still are my parents aren't really but i grew up in church you know i went to church until i was really until like right almost when i met them is around when i stopped going to church we're a very bad influence <laughs> sorry jared <laughs> well i was already you know, I was, uh, you're on already, the highway to was, hell now brother i was on the way out <laughs> I was figuring things out when I met these guys and meeting them put a lot of things into perspective. I mean, I already had a lot of conflict with music and like church going together because they weren't really, it was, you should play music for church, you know, everybody. That was kind of like the, what the family that party was. What line was. Did, right. right. Well, and it was it was just like the church family because my I was the only one who went to church at the time. I uh, I grew up 
in church. My my parents were both pretty involved, and then we we moved up here. I just started going on my own. I got connected to a youth group, and then I was just kind of bringing myself to church so I'd get rides from people and. Um, Cause that was maybe where your community was. Yeah. Yeah. And I got the most pressure from people in church. I mean, you know, because I was in like the church band and all that stuff. And, um, so, it, but you know, I was also playing music outside of church and I think there's one, at one point we, um, playing a show at like a bar or something. This was, I was like 18 or something like that. And somebody who went to the church happened to be walking by and saw me in this bar. Oh, I love this story. And then, <laughs> made, and, then, and then made like told somebody, it just got around to like the youth pastor. And then he kind of talked to me in private and was like, yeah, uh, heard you were in a bar. What? <laughs> and I'm like, well, Dude. it was actually like a really profound moment in life because that happened and it didn't take long before my the way that I looked at church just completely changed and like the people who I was going to church with it kind of became less of I I wanted to believe that they wanted what was best for me and then when I started to see that what I was interested in they thought that wasn't what was best for me it, it was weird because I don't know where my desire to play music came from, but I've just always had it. And I haven't always had this desire to, you know, lead a church band or, you know, lead people in like the religious sense. Like I never felt myself in a leadership type position to teach people, you know, I, I haven't studied the Bible in the sense that I think people should, if they're going to teach something. So that sense of uh, ownership over your actions probably rubbed you the wrong way. Well, yeah, I just didn't feel, I felt too young to have that responsibility put on me, you know, because they were kind of like really pushing me towards being a youth minister. And uh, well, guess what? I've seen the movie. That's not how it turned out. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to say something. Oh, um, so my parents would go on vacation when I was a teenager. And while they went on vacation, my brother and I were forced to go to these uh, church camps at colleges called EFY, especially for youth. And I was already like not into church at all, but I, I would go because I had to. And this one year I get there and my hair's kind of long. It's not like super long. And they're like, he can't come in here with that hair. <laughs> it's against Jeez. our dress code. And I'm like, excuse me? And like, they made me cut they this dude took me and my parents said nothing they did nothing this dude took me to a barber in santa cruz or no santa barbara because uh i was at uc santa barbara and they cut my hair and it was a horrible haircut wasn't it like a bowl cut yeah and like couldn't even give you like and a you know cool what nothing. i had like repressed to that i had repressed that memory until Just christmas now. of last oh. year no my brother brought it up my brother, my little brother was there and he brought it up and this just whoosh of anger just like came over me like, oh yeah, like that was fucking bullshit. <laughs> it's weird, man. <laughs> it is weird. And it was weird that my parents did nothing because like, they're like, yeah, we didn't care, but you know, they wouldn't let you in. It's like, what do you mean? What? Oh, that, what does hair. my hair have to do with yeah. anything religious, you know? And you know, we look at Michael Weldon who's sitting here and we think, oh boy. Eh, not, not a lot of trauma, you know, in the no, happy I, family. Yeah, I'm very, very fortunate. Always mm -hmm. loving, always supporting. Yeah. Not thrusting religion on you. No, yeah. F two parents that could not love each other more. Yeah, they, I, I'm lucky because they both came from really fucked up, broken homes. Their parents were alcoholics, drug addicts, abusers. So they knew how fucked it was. And so I think that's why they were so nice to me and my that sisters. That informed their parents. They were like, okay, well, we don't want to be like our parents. So I think that's why they were overly very nice and good. So, so I mean, you, it, your last four years, much of it spent in darkness. Oh, it was horrible. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so let's talk about that. Okay. Let's yeah. all talk about that. Yeah, I'm ready. So I feel like you in particular, like uh, the, 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 the feeling like you would never find love and die alone was, yeah. was a thing. Oh, definitely. Especially when Johnny and Jared got married because <laughs> they are my absolute best friends. And like Johnny mentioned with his wife, like their partners are genuinely good people. Like they're, they're phenomenal. They work well with, with Johnny and Jared. We all hang out. They're great. They're very nice people. 
but there's definitely a selfish, sad part of me that's like, well, where's my nice person? Like, it was hard, even though I was happy for them, it was hard to be like, man, dude, that sucks. Like, now I'm all alone. Like, they're making a new life, having a new thing with their people, and I don't have anyone. So, which is, I know, stupid, because we still hang out all the time. We still do band stuff all the time. It's not like they're gone. I still see them constantly. But that's just my own inner problem, my own worries and stuff I mean, about it if it makes you feel any better and i don't know if this is your wife has friends for me <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say i don't know if this is similar to johnny but uh it's really easy for me to get to a place to since i got married where i see all my single friends out doing stuff mm -hmm. and i lo look i love my life at home with my dogs and my wife but both of us definitely are are like you know we'll be on instagram or whatever and see all of our single friends hanging out and doing fun stuff and we're <laughs> sure, like oh yeah. Yeah, it's like it's weird how your life changes like part of it is you know intentional because you made such a huge change and then part of it feels like you just feel separate from the rest of the world mm -hmm. like you join a club you know yeah for sure and yeah. when you're married you're no longer part of the single people club right and that yeah. in itself can feel isolating if you're not careful because mm -hmm. You know, I, it's it's always the grass is always greener. I guess is what I'm totally what I'm trying to totally, say. Totally, yeah. You know, I, I think because you know Michael and I, you know, have become I would say close friends in yeah, the last few years. Definitely, um, a shoulder to cry on. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> such a strong shoulder. No, I, I just observing it from afar and sometimes up close. It just kind of felt like you you were in that classic case of like, wow, life is changing. Life, oh, life has changed. Definitely, yeah. And I I think at times it felt like you hadn't kept pace with it. Oh, yeah. And it mm -hmm. was like really scary and isolating. Oh, uh, sure. You, you would go on drives alone. Yeah, I yeah, it was really... At night. Yeah. In darkness. Yeah, definitely. L literally in darkness. Yeah. It was, it's, it's so depressing and cliche to talk about it, but it was just like, I was just, I would just be at home alone because my friends are with their wives or their partners, so they're busy. And then, like, I had roommates, but, you know, they also had partners or jobs or other things going on. And I just, I couldn't stand it. I hated being home alone. Like, no amount of music or, or video games or books, like, nothing could distract me enough, so. And that was a shift. Yeah. Because five years prior, like, playing a video game all night or whatever, that would have been no Oh, problem. oh, yeah, I'd be so stoked. But, like, it just wasn't, it just wasn't doing it. So that's why I went on drives or walks or just something to try to distract myself. It's it's like that old, it's like a weird psych 1A thing. It's like, you know, like when a baby's crying and so you go on a car ride and the the motion soothes the baby. I forget what that's called. It's it's a medical thing, I think. But <laughs> it, it's, it's <laughs> I, I believe it's a medical Dr. Thing. Michael says it's medical, but it's very much that. And, um, and yeah, but it, it also sucked because like you're still alone. You're just now in a moving vehicle. So it's not like you're, feeling any happier or you're with someone you yeah, stuff out. but you got music to me it was just as simple as like you couldn't stand to be alone with your thoughts that because, definitely because like that everything felt so dark and oh, grim yeah. that uh, it, it's a fascinating thing and i think more people w have had that one admit would it then would admit it oh, that's sure. what i think yeah i mean everyone goes through it i mean it was funny and ironic and sad because as johnny and jared are getting married this was when my relationship with my partner was coming to an end so it was like, oh no. So not only am I seeing like new love bloom, I'm seeing mine die. And then it's like this, it's like, oh no. And then my old partner pretty quickly moved on and found someone else. And, you know, God bless her, God love her, as uh, someone once told me. But that'd be me. That's that was Shimei just, that's I also his quote. said that we look forward, not back. Exactly. Which applies in this Yeah, definitely. Well. But she, she is fine and she found someone better for her and she's doing great. But it bummed me out even more that she so quickly moved on. And I'm like, fuck, I'm still here alone. And that sucked. Before we get to the brighter side of this, and there is one. Jared, you mentioned in the email leading up to this thing about uh, if, if you're comfortable sharing. Sure. Just talking about like uh, mental health struggles yeah, in yeah. relation to the band. Yeah. Why did you feel that was a good topic to bring up? Um, I think, well, this kind of ties into the general, you know, what we've all been talking about. And I think, you know, in, as far as my life goes um really like i said from 25 up to 30 i'm 30 now i'll be 31 this year um the, i think it lined up interestingly with where state falls was at and maybe part of 
where State Falls was going was prompted by this, but I definitely felt, I mean, I was going through a pretty horrible breakup at the time that like it was right before State Falls kind of, you know, took a break. Um, so I was going through a really gnarly, horrible breakup. And on the other side of that, I just felt just pretty awful and, and had to reflect on myself a lot more than, and reflect on my family and just a, a lot more than I think I was ready for. There's a lot of things going on in my family with uh, drug addiction, um, a lot of stuff that I, part of, uh, I didn't know all of it was there. So a lot of that hit me, you know, in that, there's like a span of, of one year that everything just kind of hit me at once. So the breakup happened, and then I find out that, you know, I found out about all this stuff that was happening in my family. And um, he, he, as I was reflecting on it or just kind of thinking about it, it kind of showed me how much stuff was affecting me that I didn't realize was affecting me. There's a lot of, I realized that my routine would be to come home from work hide in my room, watch TV until I fall asleep, wake up late, give myself maybe five minutes to get ready, go back to work. It was just kind of repeat cycle, like a, a really kind of lousy cycle that I didn't realize I was in until everything kind of hit me at once. And um, definitely informed my, at least uh, my willingness to want to branch off and do a new musical project or at least kind of turn what we were doing into something else that could maybe kind of address some of the chaos that I was feeling, maybe kind of make sense of it. And I think, you know, out of that came Slow Bloom, and it was really incredibly liberating for me to um, do Slow Bloom. It was the first time that I had ever really written a song from start to finish, you know, taken on some, you know, cause I mean, I play drums in State Falls, but not that I didn't play drums in Slow Bloom, <laughs> I did, but um, I guess having a different role in shaping the songs felt really liberating. And um, all throughout that process, it was interesting because it was incredibly freeing, but then on the other side of it, on the private end of it, in my own life, things were still kind of not making sense and still in a lot of ways they don't make sense but i had to address a lot of stuff with my family um with my relationship the way that i looked at relationships because this is also it was maybe like not long after state falls kind of took a break that i met my wife I think you met her at the tail end of State Faults. I think you might she have had never seen State Faults play, though. But it's also no, pronounced. We were still my wife. State Faults was still a thing because I think you had just gone on a date with her, like right prior to the last time you were on the show. I could be wrong. Fun fact: <laughs> my current girlfriend, who I've been with for the past year, almost year and a half, I met online on an online dating site. Which online dating site? Uh, was that? It was OK Cupid. OK Cupid. Yeah. And then was there was Christian there uh, <laughs> farmers only? <laughs> <laughs> so this was again. This was like 2014, 2015. This uh -huh. period you're talking about right yeah. here. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know. Going into this, I didn't even really realize like how deep down you all had to go in order to emerge. But you know, you mm -hmm. all have emerged. Sure. Things are feeling oh, yeah. better. Yeah. And you talk about the work you've done, and this is something both of you guys can talk about. Actually, all three of you can talk about because mm -hmm. Michael, you're in a relationship with somebody who values your your art as well. Thank you. But yeah. you're not married, but these two are. Right. And, you, and you two feel like uh, the journey to marriage and being married to these people you're married to have improved not only your life, but also the music that you make. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I mean... <laughs> Because there are some who would perceive that once you get married, um, the time for a band is over. You know, like that shuts the door. Oh, yeah. It's now I mean, time that, for domesticated that was, life. I never thought I would get married, actually, until I met her. I think that informs the new state faults a lot because I think in 2014 or 2015, by that point, all three of our albums had been dealing with like struggles with anxiety and all the mental health stuff that I was going through. And you know, I started listening to a little bit less screamo and emo and hardcore and all that. And uh, 
just really didn't want to be like grouped in or like associated with like the emo thing for a second I think I just wanted I didn't want to be defined by the music I made in State Faults and so that's why I ran away from it and through my wife and through my mirror my partner like helping me realize better who I am um, I realized that it was me that dictated the music that State Faults made and not the music that State Faults made that dictated who I was and so I think uh that's why we had to come back so that yeah. we could like make it as our new selves. If you have more personal clarity, you have more of a, a grasp on who you are. It's a lot easier, especially if you're trying to do music professionally, because there's such so much pressure and we were all feeling it. I, I, we, we were so young. I mean, so young, <laughs> but I felt so young. We were younger. Yeah. Well, we were only like 20 when we started yeah. the band. Well, well, yeah. you get, well, Jared was like 45. You get so. swept up in it, you know, and things start happening and everything is going and you're all gung ho and you start, start to find some success. And then all of a sudden you find yourself stacked up against all these other bands who are trying to do the same thing. And you start feeling the pressure like it's a competition, especially at the time that we were doing our band, because I feel like there are a lot of just within the genre, there are a lot of competing, um, you know, projects and different bands everybody was kind of reaching for the same goal and so at least for me I felt the pre I felt a lot of pressure and feeling pressure in that way kind of can make you feel like you're not sure what the right choices to make or maybe you're making choices but they're not based on how you should be feeling you, you're kind of acting out of the fear rises. The fear, the fear rises yeah. that you're not doing the right thing. Right. Not doing right. It's easy to get envious. It's yeah. easy to feel like it's like you got to win or maybe like you're not winning and you should be. So maybe you're doing something wrong. And I think, at least for me, when I was reflecting on this, you kind of, I kind of realized a lot of that was coming from my own personal insecurity in life and just not knowing where I fit into my own life. You know, and once you start to feel more grounded and once you start to feel like you kind of know who you are as an individual, that can really help inform who you are as a group. Because when we're all working on all cylinders as individuals, it's, it's much, much easier to feel confident about what you're doing and not feeling like it has to be something that it isn't, you, you know, it can, it can feel more natural. Um, and I think just having we just needed the time away as well. Do you feel like you all have less fear now in this era than you did in the previous era? I, I, <laughs> I'd say musically. Musically, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. I feel a lot more confident in what we're doing musically. What about non-musically? Non-musically, I mean, me. I mean, the fear is always there, and I think it should be scary because if it's not scary, it's not worth doing. What? Right. What? what what's scary? Just leaping into such a crazy thing as doing per, like pursuing music professionally like just you know being in a fucking band you that know and, like, taking it to the next level and mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to know too this is not just a band that played locally and didn't do much else like this is a band that actually had kind of inverse success to a lot <laughs> of what the bands around here do yeah, truly because I feel like you had like a, a fan base that was largely outside of Sonoma County, mm -hmm. yeah. and you oh, were yeah. you were able to tour in ways that bands did not tour from around here. You you just had you had a level of I mean some do, but, yeah. but yeah. most bands don't get to do what you did when you were in your twenties. Would you right. agree with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. definitely. I, guess. I mean, yeah. and and in the four years you've been gone, there have been people. I mean, not not hundreds of thousands, but you have definitely had a consistent stream of people saying like, "Please come back, please come back, yeah. please Weird. come back." Yeah, it's been crazy. Yeah. yeah, and I was one of them. Um, <laughs> we listened, but uh, back to the fear thing. It's like uh, uh, musically, I, I hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. but r just generally, you know, because you you talked about uh, in the lead up to this also about like fear of uh, failure, fear of not living up to expectations. Oh, sure. It's been like kind of a recurring thing, yeah, uh, collectively for you. Yeah, I'm yeah. just I'm just curious, like in these like new roles that you inhabit in your life, like do do you feel like you have as much fear? going forward or do you feel more grounded i feel more grounded yeah. yeah i i waver like there's i i absolutely love and trust these guys and i know whatever we do it's gonna be okay but in my personal life i fear probably what everyone else does i fear of failing my parents i feel of failing my partner i fear 
like it's all the stuff you got to let go of man. exactly exactly and that's um that's what's kind of hard is because you know you don't it's also subjective it's not one right way or another way but but can you, that, can and, you go into deeper because i feel like you especially like have done some like huge philosophical <laughs> journeying in the last few years truly yeah, yeah um i mean that's i think the thing that my wife has been so amazing at is just sh- allowing like showing me and giving me the space to work through my anxieties and my fears and to you know she's it's a constant practice you know to just remind myself like at the end of the day, I'm okay. I got a great, you know, support system. My bandmates, my wife is there. We got two adorable cats. Like, you know, you, you got to start counting all of the really positive stuff in your life and then just like, like confining all the negative stuff and like just kind of casting it aside and being like, none of that is pushing me forward. So don't give it any attention, you know? I think a huge thing for me too was learning, you know, realizing that I wasn't the only person feeling how I was feeling. It's really easy, especially when you're a teenager and going into your twenties, it's really easy to feel like, um, you're alone in the anxiety that you feel or whatever feelings you have about other people or what other people might be thinking of you, or maybe you're just worried about where am I going to end up? You know, what's my future look like? I have to make this career choice. What, what's the right choice? What's the wrong choice? Learning that other people probably were feeling that just as much as I was and it it's still difficult you know to reach out to other people about things that have been so private I mean things that you've been feeling your whole life and have kept to yourself it's such a protected it's this thing that's in this secret place and it's one thing to like think okay other people probably have this really secret protected pain as well but it can be hard to reach out to people about it because it's been mine for so long. Nobody's ever seen it, you know, but I'm starting to feel more comfortable letting people see, hey, I've got this thing that I've been carrying around for the past 30 years or whatever, you know. Um, it's always been my thing, but do you have this thing too? And most of the time other people do, they're like, yeah, I deal with anxiety or I deal with depression, I have my whole life. And so that's been, for me, that's been a huge um, like hurdle that I've crossed, and it's made me feel less fearful because I feel less alone. You know, well, I think what's difficult too is you build your whole life around those, you know, things you feel shame about, uh-huh. those things that you don't want to tell anybody. Yeah. So you, if you look at your life as a room, all the furniture. Right. It's, it's built ugly, around that. And it's ugly and it's, <laughs> it's hard to look at and you don't want to live and, in it. And in order to get to it, you have to like clear out the room, which uh-huh. is incredibly difficult because you've got a life to live. You've got a, you know, a wife to be present for. You've got a band yeah. to show up for. You have a job to go to. So like doing the work is one of the most difficult things. Oh, you especially can do. Yeah. when you get married. I mean, even leading up to the marriage, the, the idea that I'm going to let somebody else into this room and they're going to see all the things that I hid in the corners or that I tucked underneath the sofa or whatever, like all those secret things, I can only keep them hidden for so long. Like she's going to see it. And so you, you panic for a second. You're like, am I ready for this? Can I do this? Like, are there things that I want to remain a secret? And then you have to ask yourself like, what's why, like, why does it need to be secret? What should it be a secret? You know what I mean? Like those are things that you have to kind of face. And you know, I mean, we're still, you know, this marriage is still fresh. We still have many years to go, but it's, it feels like I've aired a lot of things that haven't been aired my whole life and it, and it's refreshing. It's scary, but it's refreshing. So there's still some fear attached to that, but I feel ready to kind of face, you know, there's certain things you can't face when you're hanging on to that anxiety and that pain and that depression and all and all that stuff and once you let somebody else in and they can see it too and you you listen to their opinions and perspectives about it then you start to feel ready to address it and then maybe say i don't need to drag this thing around with me 
Yeah, I mean, you have two choices, I think, when you carry this trauma, which I think we all do in our own way. You can live a compromised and safe life, or you can live like a fuller and right. more dangerous uh, life. Yeah. And, um, you know, dangerous in that, like, you may lose people. Um, but, you may, you, you you may might isolate change. yourself. And you might, well, you, you all have changed. Right. You yeah. Sometimes it's a fear of becoming a different person. Like, you look at all the opportunity that exists. You look at the potential for who you could be. And sometimes that's really scary to think about. Like, I know I want to do these things, but can I do it? I don't know. And it's just putting out the intention. I mean, I, (laughs) it's, it's, I mean, it sounds dumb, but like on my phone, my phone background right now is Crosby stills, Nash and young playing this arena show. And it looks so bananas, but I'm like, that's what I'm putting out there. Like, these are the kind like, I want to play crazy big shows and you know you 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 yeah like i said earlier you stop giving attention you stop feeding you stop sitting on the furniture in that room on that dirty room and you start working it out if if things can be changed you know and like how can you change them you know oh, i'm feeling envious you know i'm feeling envious of other bands and stuff and what other people are doing like unfollow them on social media clear your feed clear i mean not just clear like your insta feed but clear your mental feed of all the negative stuff you know yeah put energy into the right thing yeah put energy in the right things and heart into the right things you know what are the right things whatever makes you happy uh, what whatever makes your, your bliss is music what, makes me what happy. is that it <laughs> music makes me so happy yeah but boy i'll tell you what your relationship is really i, I I'm, I'm sitting at this table i'm listening to you guys now and, and i've been flashing on the last conversation i had <laughs> with you five years ago <laughs> boy are you guys calm yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's really fun. calm I, yeah down. i was thinking about that too and at first i was kind of freaked out i'm like man we're not really like jumping around and like yelling and laughing like are, is this bad and i'm like no i think we're just we're just grounded or, are yeah. you comfortable no, no. yeah oh yeah i feel yeah. fine i just but yeah i thought the same thing i was like man it's so different from i yeah, guess like half a decade ago feel the difference i you know yeah. i'm looking forward to i may actually spend some time going back and looking at the last uh, <laughs> i know i want to last episode last i yeah i recently listened to it in preparation of this to kind of remember what it's like and uh do you feel like we're different people oh a hundred percent like it's so <laughs> well, bananas do, do a that's, thing that's a tough thing you're not different people it's just uh you you are the same yeah. people that you always were yeah. mm-hmm. and uh you always will be there's always going to be that part of you there will be things that you remember from your childhood 60 years ago <laughs> that seemed like a week ago yeah, yeah and totally. you can still understand the motivation that, that that put you there and some of those motivations are still there <laughs> but uh there is a calmness that you guys have, have found about yourselves i think it's not that you're different but you're a hell of a lot more comfortable with who you are sure yeah i definitely feel more comfortable yeah yeah totally I love to compare everything you just said with a segment from the last episode where I asked you about the band name. I was like, is this a political name? What is it? <laughs> and the the, uh, the quip that you returned with was, some people are uh, musicians, artists, uh, individuals are very opinionated and right. political. And they would say, oh, state faults. That sounds like a statement of some kind. But you, you roll your eyes at that. Well, <laughs> well it's really just like bad-mouthing Michael. Because he has so many faults. Right. <laughs> We're always stating them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have a new album coming out now. Here we are. Yeah. Four yeah. years later. Mm-hmm. Do you have a title for this album? Yes. Yes. What is that title? It's called Clairvoyant. Clairvoyant. Well, I think that may have something to do with maybe some of the themes of this album. And obviously, this conversation we've just had kind of like went in and out, weaved in and out about like where you're at and, mm-hmm. and like yeah. what, what you're channeling into the music. But could you tell us like a little bit about not, not like the songs, but just like when you step away from it, um, just kind of themes of this album. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to speak entirely for Johnny because he, <laughs> he writes a lot of the lyrics, uh, all, all the lyrics. lyrics. And by that, I mean all the lyrics. But um, I think a big part of it is um, just like self-love, trying to figure yourself out, figure out your place in the world. I mean, feel free to take the... Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. Self-love and self-care. And uh, I think which touches on a lot of what we talked about, but like rebirth and renewal and, and finding yourself and just also, um, you know, it's, I mean, it's all, it's about all that. And it's about the changes I went through, but in a lot of ways, it's not a very, like, it's not a autobiographical or like a diary page from me this time, uh, for the album, the album I wrote more for the younger people out there, the, 
the people making positive changes in the world and the and all the social changes happening you know it's a it's music geared more towards supporting them and and showing them love and showing that we're here and that we care and yeah to to let go of old things and the old ways of doing things, the old uh, negative things and, and letting it all go. We may end the episode there. <laughs> fuck, how good was that? That was Thank so you. good. But I, yeah, I mean, that's good. that's your closing thought right there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, my God. Thank how you. We do a lot been? of these, but hold on. <laughs> I'm not ready to I, I gotta go. No, 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 it's not over <laughs> yet. Okay, good. I, I, uh, I, have, I, I you're, it's now Michael, Michael Weldon's time. Before we start on me, yeah. can I pee? I Fuck need, you. I, I need yes, a pee too. Pee. I'm gonna okay. Pee. It's going to take two seconds. Okay. So you can yeah. keep it in. I think it's a comical. Yeah, go, is it we'll, a good visual we'll go gag? Go, we'll go, we'll go together. Hey, I mean, look. Yeah, that's fine. It's a good visual gag. Yeah. I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I mean. Now you can truly. You know what's wait, interesting about this broken? episode? Um, no, no, really, just really pee. like. Oh, just go upstairs. Go upstairs and pee. Go, go. Again, kind of an inverse. Like, you did not talk that much on the last one. No. And you are the you are the backbone of this episode. I got a lot to say. Yeah, I appreciate it. Hey, you know. It's been quite a five years with you guys. Well, I mean, what do you feel like we're yeah, like? so much calmer. Well, like, no, I just mean in terms of life in general. So, like, oh. I've thought about this theory that, like, there are certain periods in life where you kind of, it's like a transition where you, you stop. You, you, I don't know if it's like your brain is actually changing at these points or what, but, like, you stop it's not that you stop being that person, but just metaphorically, you, you, you're not that person anymore. You're this, you still have the same, you're still the same person, but yeah. you, it's like a, um, a new, you look at life differently. Like you get new eyes, you know, like you shed, you shed the husk. It's the way you're doing it now. You're a lot more comfortable. Get oh, on the mic. Recording? Yeah. Why not? Oh, why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Say that again. Let's keep For it going. For me, it's kind of the way, it's, it's the way you're doing it now. You seem to be more comfortable. You're, you mm -hmm. look back at the things that used to drive you crazy, you, you, the mis mistakes that you would make. Yeah. And even though sometimes you make those same mistakes, you realize, ah, oh, but it's going to flow. It, 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 it actually flowed the last time you made the mistake. It will flow again, and you will move forward as you're making those, whatever you're doing, everything is moving forward. Everything is yeah. moving forward. Now that seems to be it. I mean, I am just so amazed with how much things just keep moving forward. Right. And I, I, uh, it, it's like a wave that's just going to keep pushing you forward anyway. And you even get comfortable with that. It's like you finally have, have learned how to surf. I was just going to say that. It's like the mold gets set at a certain point and uh -huh. you're like, all right, this is you. Now, yeah. uh, you, like that's and that's when you learn to surf at that yeah. moment. Yeah, you know, what I mean, it's not it's not that you stop changing, right? But I think at a certain point, like the the change becomes more gradual. Well, do you still have milestone? Like like my twenties, obviously mid twenties, that was a milestone. I yeah. think um, turning, you know, like sixteen maybe, or becoming a teenager, oh like that's a milestone. I mean, I think they're more profound when you're younger, just to me, because the most interesting thing is uh, to think about like the five year test. Like, think about who yeah. you were five years ago. Think oh, about who bananas. you were 10 years ago. Right. And <gasps> to me, quite different. And yeah. even, yeah. even now, yeah. I'm almost 35. When I look at what, I mean, it's... Happy early birthday. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It, it, 30 to 35, I'm a lot more similar than I was 25 to 30. Right. In, that, in right. the same way, I was 20 to 25, I changed uh -huh. a lot. The change is more gradual. Yeah, but okay. no, I mean, but I've never been someone who really cares about age milestones. Sure, sixteen is not a big deal to me. Twenty is not a big deal to right. me. Thirty is not a big deal to me. Yeah. I think about that in terms of like, um, just like not necessarily philosophically, but like you know, I'm curious as to what. Not that anybody can prepare a person for what they're going to look forward to as they get old, because everybody's journey is different, you know. Um, but I'm always interested in talking to you know people yeah. who are more experienced, older. older. Yeah. Um, if there were mo like, did you have similar moments like around this age? Did you have another similar moment? Maybe at a at a different, not just age, but like a period in life for like. Oh, I'm a, I'm a bad example. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't pay attention. Okay. You know, and, and honest to God, I. Uh, Who knows how old Tom Gaffey I, really I, even I is? Twenty seven. Myself, I, I, really, <laughs> I kind of got stuck at uh, uh, probably about. 12 I think. <laughs> no i think you got stuck at whatever age you were in 1983 which is when you started down here yeah that hell yeah well seriously how old were you in 83 uh what was i uh it would have been uh, let's see 55 to 83 it would have been uh, uh 37 it would be under 27. 28 28 
Yeah. 28. I, I think, oh, I said 27. That's yeah, so yeah. close. I, I think that <laughs> when, when we look at your life, I think that's a really good way to look at it. Yeah, because that, because yeah. you and I are bad examples because yeah. you're not married. I'd be shocked if I get yeah. married. <laughs> We, we just, our lives look a lot different than right. most like normies. Sure. You know, yeah. yeah the, sure. the deal is that I it finally at, at 60, cause I'm about to be 64 here soon enough. I, I realize that I'm comfortable being an eccentric. Uh, yeah. and it just, <laughs> I, great. yeah, it just, there's no changing now. I mean, I have, I have ridden this horse long enough to know that, holy shit, this horse got to last as long as I do. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel that's like that's deal. recent though? Becoming comfortable being an eccentric? Yeah, it is. I, I, uh, you know, look. One of my favorite expressions when we'd be, I'd be cruising with friends or hanging out, and, and I'd look over at my friend and go, "Whoa, you're not Carol," because <laughs> <laughs> I always assumed growing up that by now I'd be married to somebody, Carol or Alice. Or, <laughs> yeah, you know, there I'd be. Yeah, and there we'd be, and that just, uh, it, I just never quite right. crossed that threshold. I never found myself. I thought I, I, I did for a long time. It uh -huh. looked like I even planned on that. And we I went through the relationships and all that. Uh -huh. But every time we talked about getting married, that really ruined it. Right. And it was probably me that was ruining it. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I uh, it took me a while, but I'm, yeah, I'm an eccentric. Well, okay. So you, Johnny, you had like the best way of ending the episode, but I do have a couple notes of business. I don't know if we want to pile on Michael at all. I'm, I you might know, be ready. Let's, let's know, sit I, here. I mean, just cause you know, we've like really talked about some just serious stuff. For it's out. like a, a point of contention about you is your diet. You know, a lot of people give you a hard time about your diet. <laughs> yes. And I'm going to be the contrarian on this one and say it's fine. Okay. Whoa. You know, wh oh, why do we not like perfect. his diet? What's the problem? Should I, before I, should I plead my case? No, before? we should. We, yeah, no, you case. didn't. Yeah. Plead your case. So, um, I'm not trying to make excuses, but part of the reason why I eat poorly, drink a lot of soda, that kind of stuff. A lot of fast food, a lot of candy, a lot of Coca-Cola. A lot of that stuff. There's a couple reasons. One reason is just um, laziness. It's just convenient. Uh, one reason is just price point. It's just cheap. Uh, the two biggest reasons are coming up. Reason one is it's just a horrible habit. Um, going back to my lovely parents, who I love so much, they were 19 when they had me, very young. And so I think it was just cheaper and easier for them to kind of buy these kind of things. And that's what they used to feed us. And it was a different time. It was before, you know, Whole Foods and other things was more prevalent. And so I think it's kind of become a horrible ingrained thing where it's like, oh, it's time for lunch. I guess it's time to drink soda with my lunch because I've done that for almost 30 years. And so it's unlearning all these things. Fourth reason, we're going to get a little depressing. <laughs> so, so many reasons. And I'm moving past this. It's not so much like this anymore. But going back to like my kind of dark couple of years, a lot of it is just kind of about like the, the antithesis of self-care. It's like, well, fuck, man. I don't care about myself. No one cares about me. I'm unloved. No one's going to love me. So who, who cares? Who cares that I eat like garbage? Who cares that I feel like garbage? Who I'm not trying to impress anyone, and obviously no one cares about me. No one's going to love me romantically, which I know is bullshit. I know that's not <laughs> true, but during my darkest... feels like that sometimes. Exactly. So during my darkest days, it's like, it doesn't fucking matter, and I drink a soda in the shower, because I, I, I don't... <laughs> Because <laughs> I don't, I don't, because uh, I don't drink alcohol. Uh, I don't claim edge, but I don't drink alcohol. But. You're trying to reproduce leaving Las Vegas with soda. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. So, so during like my darkest times, that's kind of where it came in too. Because it was like, well, fuck, man. Like, who, who cares? No one cares about me, so it doesn't matter what I do. It, it's, and it's like momentary happiness consuming sugar. You see. When, and those are when times get like that, you need to remember the wise words of Journey's own Steve Perry. Uh -huh. Be good to yourself because nobody else will. Damn. That's yeah. And I mean... And the wheel in the sky keeps on turning. The wheel yeah. in the sky does keep on turning. But again, it's like when you're, when you're faced with the thought of nobody loves me or nobody cares, so why should I care about myself? And it's like you can change that so simply just being like i care about myself and then you know the change starts there sure i think it's just it's finding you know the the strength to be like you know like i still matter you know yeah. I'm still a person i still care and like this is still a vessel that i get to keep and it's in good shape right now but if i keep it up the way it is like 
you know, it's not going to be good forever. And then I'm going to be really fucked. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was just hard because that and I like I don't want it to be a pity party or anything or be like my life because my life's actually pretty <laughs> I great. Get it. But yeah, it was just <laughs> we've all been there. I mean, we all yeah. ate garbage. Oh, I still. Yeah, eat I still eat garbage, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a part of Michael's brand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but but I think you can take heart in the fact that in your future, once your body totally craps out. <laughs> There will be drones to do it all for you. That's true. That is true. Uh, he will be the bionic man. Yeah, I'll be. I'll become RoboCop. Like that. When that technology comes around, I'll be RoboCop. Yeah, so. ro- robot Michael doesn't need vitamins. No, <laughs> I, I, he just I, needs oil. I think, <laughs> <laughs> Feed him oil. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you're not in bad shape. No, and I mean that's that's the thing that's really funny. Well, I, I well, okay, so let's go back. There, there are like, it's like peaks, you know, like on a graph. Cause there's times where I'm like, I'm going to be good and I'm going to do something about my life. And so uh, last year I saw a nutritionist, which I thought was a waste of time, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. But well, see, I don't, Come I don't on, know anything. An so for crying out it was a waste of time. Waste. So now part of the problem, yes, maybe on the but, outside looking. Hold on. Why was it a waste of time? Because the problem was you. Of the problem was you. The problem was had nothing to do with your diet. The problem was like he knows what's feel, wrong with his diet. Yeah. 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 So that's the, the problem, I guess you're the right. The problem was like yeah. I, I want to be loved. Yes. And like it's all I'm thinking about. Uh-huh. And I've got these like hookup apps, and it's like all I'm doing. And yeah. I'm like wait, just wait, wait, every look. fucking swipe is a reminder like, yeah. of how no one will love me. Yeah. And how perfect everyone else is, and what a fucking beast so, I am. Uh, so yeah. hold on. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, and we all do this. We're like, oh, it's like obviously it's this like little thing over here if i just do this it'll all be better sure and i yeah. thought the nutritionist while a good way of like spending time not in misery because you make yourself a task put it on the calendar yeah. you go there and uh-huh. do it uh-huh. I very just, proactive like, yeah. exactly but i was just like fuck this is not at the core of it at all no it's not and i that's part of the problem that was funny is <laughs> i went before the nutritionist i i went to like the doctor doctor and i was like god do i am in like physical pain i feel sick and he brought up the diet but what he kind of uncovered more he was like tell me about like how you feel Mm. and so i went over everything i'd been going through and he's like you're probably feeling a horrible pain in your stomach because of anxiety depression this that and yeah diet has something to do with it but it's also kind of your emotional state so he was like yeah definitely see a nutritionist but also talk to this uh maybe therapist i can't help but notice you have great teeth thank you that's (laughs) so funny you say that because i don't feel like i do well, they, they, from here, they look good for Thank you. Yeah, I'm actually how, going but, to the dentist. You know, and Johnny weeks. has probably seen this for years in Michael. It's like, how often does Michael beat Michael up for something? Michael which is beats not himself bad. up too much. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Michael beats himself too much. He, he's he's such a good boy. Thank he's you. He's so good, and he, he makes so many people happy. Thank like, you. Thank you, John. He makes me the happiest. Like, yeah. yeah. I've gotten he I, he's made me happy for 22 years, yeah. man. Best friends. And so when he gets are. down on himself, it, it hurts me too. Yeah, we all need therapy, I think. Yeah, I, that's definitely <laughs> well, the that's biggest. That's what we're doing here tonight. Yeah. Definitely, some that's, kind of monster too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's stuck to my ears, and so basically, that's the biggest thing. It's just, I, I just I don't know what it is because kind of I was talking to Johnny about this. Like I have such a good support group with my friends, my family, you, my my new partner. I have so many positive things in my life, and yet I can't help but be like, well, this is bad. That is bad. I could do this better, or I don't want to let this person I love how down. Both, a, of the no, band me- both of the band members just kind of straightened up and put the mic in the speaking position. Well, yeah. it's just a pr- and that, and that kind of goes with the bad eating, where it's like... But here's the thing, yeah. and I totally relate to this, and I'll add that I don't, I don't come from a place of knowing... Uh, the the answers oh, because, of course because here's the thing yeah it it is a matter of perspective it's yeah. all perspective but mm-hmm. the biggest thing of it is i think is that it's finding perspective from a person who can explain it in terms that make sense to you so it's like like inception oh. like you need like okay so the way that okay so when i was um like maybe like 11 or 12 right okay yeah and i was um i was i'm i was actually probably younger 11 or 12. I'll just say 11 or okay. 12 for the sake of this conversation. What so I was having, I, I, I don't remember, but <laughs> I do remember that I was with my dad uh-huh. and I was, um, you know, throwing a tantrum. I was upset about something, yeah. right? And I was giving him shit about something. And that's what happened often with me and my dad. We didn't always get along. And if this was such a pivotal moment in life. Like I still remember, like it was yesterday, he got, it was like a, um, 
not like a medical book, but like a like a book about the brain, about like brain development, about you know like different fa- you know just all about mm-hmm. brain and human development. And he had, I think he already looked this up. He like had this chapter. He's like, come here, I want to show you something. He opens up the book and he points in this chapter and he's like, this is what your brain is doing right now. This is why you feel the way that you feel. Because when you're this age, your brain is only this developed. And it's not until you get this much older that your brain is going to develop. And then you'll start to see what I'm saying. But right now you can't because this is where your brain is at. Mm. Just However, I wonder where you're taking this one. Go ahead. <laughs> so, okay, so however he phrased that in that moment, just it just cut through. Like I just I got it because he put it in a way that and I didn't even realize this at the time, but it spoke to how I learn. And hearing him say it in the way that he did. So what I've since reflecting on that, what I've learned about myself is that it's really hard to for me to take advice from people unless I believe that they're coming from a place of authority and not just that, but I have to believe that they actually know what they're talking about and that they speak from experience. So like my friends can tell me, Oh, you probably, you, you know what? That's, what? that's something I've totally noticed about you. Yeah. They'll say <laughs> yeah. you need to do this or here's the right thing or like, and they could be totally right. Giving me advice. It's right on the nose. But it's like a mental block in my head like for whatever reason when that person says it i don't want to listen but then if this person says it who i believe in my head maybe comes from a place of more experience or more authority then i'll be like oh okay yeah i mean yeah he's he's probably right Mm -hmm. and i know it drives people crazy how does that tie into him though okay so how it ties into you is that because when it comes to things like your self-worth or Mm -hmm. um how you feel about life or just depression in general people can give you all the advice they want they can say oh you should probably do this or oh you're feeling this way because i've i've gone through what you're going through before you should try this when i hear hear people tell me that i'm like yeah okay sure like but you're not me so you don't really know yeah right he has a way of doing that too skip back 10 10 minutes in this interview you 100 percent do this do what people are giving you advice you preemptively go "Uh uh-huh uh-huh. Well, you, uh-huh. <laughs> which to me, when I hear yeah. you do that, it's like, oh, he stopped listening. Yeah. Well, it's I, hard. I yeah. do the same exact yeah. thing. Yeah. So, so my point being is Cause, that cause there's a difference between the point being made and then doing the, uh-huh well, yeah. or the, uh-huh being made yeah. during it's the point. It's the most frustrating part of my life is knowing that somebody is right, but not believing yeah. them for this, yeah. you know, sure. like I know they're right, but <laughs> no, I just, but really, yeah, sure. But I don't, but I don't believe them for some stupid reason. And I know that I'm doing it. Yeah. I was just going to say like when it comes to self care and self love, I mean, like I said, it's just, it's a constant practice. Cause it's not oh, like yeah. I got married and all of a sudden my life was like magically easier and nothing ever bothered me or, but in being shown or being given the tools to recognize that negative you know, thing happening in my head, that negative Mm -hmm. cycle happening, I can break it, be like, no, it's okay. I can deal with it. It's okay. Well, that's what I look to like, look at therapy as, as like a, it's like a class that you take to, to teach you how to navigate your brain because people don't, you don't tend to look at your brain like it's a muscle or like any other part of your body. Like if you, something happens to your legs, if you get in an accident, your legs are all fucked up. Like you need to go to physical therapy and you need to relearn how to how to work your legs. Otherwise, you're going to walk around with a limp. Your legs are just going to grow shitty mm-hmm. and you're going to, you know, be the guy with a weird walk because you <laughs> yeah. refuse to to go to physical therapy. And the, the brain is the same way, you know, and you a lot of people tend to look at things like tend to look at shitty feelings that they have and they'll go, um, well, I wasn't abused as a child or nothing really traumatic happened to me. I had a great upbringing. Two, so two parents that loved each other. Right. Not a, not a care in the world. So you, you feel guilty. Like, why should I plenty of other people, you know, might need therapy. Why should I, if it almost feels selfish or feels like an overreaction. God, that's, that's a hundred percent how I feel. <laughs> yeah. But the point, the point that I'm making is that lots of different things, especially over time, like it doesn't just take one huge traumatic event to like fuck you up. And then you're like, Oh, I need therapy. Mm -hmm. It's like if you play a sport for years and years and years, but you're not tending to all the little injuries that you're getting, 
they're going to accumulate until you can no longer play that sport efficiently because you have all these things that you just didn't take care of. And it's just like any other part of your body. If you, I haven't been to the dentist in forever and I know I have a million different things and you just get used to like dealing with it. Like I can't chew food on this side of my mouth, but it's been that way for years. So I guess I'll just chew all my food on this side of my mouth. And when I can no longer chew food on this side, I guess I'll just eat my food through a straw. You, and arra- then you, you arrange your life around <laughs> it. Right. And then before you know it, you're completely compromised. But it wasn't one traumatic thing right. that caused all of that. It's just life over time beats you up. And eventually, I think all people would be so much better off if you had like a routine check in. I wish mm-hmm. it was more affordable. That's the biggest thing that I hate is I wish mental health care wasn't such A, I wish it wasn't so stigmatized in society. And B, I wish it wasn't so expensive. You know what's wild is like this was maybe just an intervention for Michael to go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something that that's it's like I'm absolutely shook because that's 100 percent what Jared said is how I feel. It's like I feel guilty because I'm because I'm like, what? like on paper and kind of it's the truth. It's like my life is so great. Like literally nothing bad has ever happened and everyone has always treated me well. And I've always been so fortunate and and. And yet, why do I still feel so bad? And so that's why I feel guilty and I feel shitty. Like, but, but why? Like, I, nothing that bad happened. And here, here's the other part of that too. The other thing is that we, and this is like in life now, with everything being as easy as it is, information is just you know a click away. Everything is so connected. There's really nothing like you're no, you don't really have to fend for yourself. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. there, the stakes are so low in life that I think in technology, all that change has happened so fast in terms of like human history that I think human evolution hasn't caught up to that. So I think depression, I mean, you think about going back to before the industrial revolution and people, you know, a lot of people were dying at like 30, but you get to this age now, we don't have a family, you know, you don't have a family with kids, you're still, you still got the rest of your life to look forward to. You, you know, you still got another like 40 years. So you got another 60 years. Sure. Yeah, depending on how it, well, how it if goes. the diet doesn't change. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I guess so, years. so grandpa Bill's still around and he has the same diet. So the point being is that these, He's not the doing stuff well. that we're <laughs> dealing with now, people didn't maybe didn't have to deal with that shit then oh, because yeah, they were totally. dying young. Yeah. So it's like, this is normal. Like having like mental health, we have to take care of that now because we all live longer because we don't have as many things to worry about. Like if you spent, if you lived like, uh, like in the wilderness and you had to, had to fend for yourself, you had to kill, you know, your food and all that stuff. You, you wouldn't have time to think about, Oh, I'm having a shitty day. Like you'd be too, you'd be trying to survive, but we're fortunate that we don't have to worry about all Mm -hmm. that stuff. So all the things that, all those things start to creep back in. Totally. And it's not that it's that's, abnormal. That's not fortunate. <laughs> you <laughs> well, have to worry. Sure. Yeah. Holy shit. You mean I don't got to worry about nothing but me? <laughs> yeah. That sucks. That's, right. uh, oh that is God. interesting. That's a, that's 100% what my parents talked about too. Because they're very nice and we're open and we can discuss our feelings and yeah. stuff. And I've asked them. I'm like, haven't you been like my age? And like, right. like you had kids when you were my age. Like weren't you freaking out? And they're like, no. I mean, kind of. But like we were so fucking busy working all the time and raising kids i didn't really have a minute to be like oh yeah well michael what you do after you leave this table is up to you but we've certainly given you some guidance thank you i, I think the problem is you got too much time on your hands that's 100 percent the problem and it's funny because it's like during that like turmoil time where i was sad i took on a lot of things like we were in slow bloom i was in other i started other musical projects i did other things me and Johnny would just like jam by ourselves. But it's funny that now that like I'm back with State Falls and things are getting busy, I have a new partner, romantic partner. I have a new job. It's like, oh, well, now I'm kind of busy again. And now I don't really have the time to just be like, oh, and, like sad. Yeah, just do what Tom and I do. Just stay busy all the time. Stay busy. Yeah. Well, this has been a wild ride. Yeah. It has. Uh, Love State, it. State Falls 2019. Here we are. Yeah. Here, Here we are. Wow. You know, I Stay don't... tuned for State Falls 2025. <laughs> 2020, 2023. 2023. 2023. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
I feel like Michael became a man during this conversation. Yeah. We started you know, the conversation I am, out. I didn't have this mustache when I started. You were, now, we, now were about, we were about to. You made an edit note. You're like, I'll edit this out. And yeah. then we got into that conversation. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, all I can say is like, I mean, how do you even conclude this episode other than to say, you know, I've gotten to know all of you since yeah. you first appeared on the show. I just really appreciate you being so willing to share it all. Sure. Because like, I mean, I think you have been actually – uh, quite purposeful, Jared, in this conversation about like, hey, I've struggled with these things. I'm going to speak about these things and yeah. maybe other people will hear them and feel that. So well, part of it is my part of it is my is me addressing is is my learning process. It, how I've gotten through a lot of this stuff is to be more open and, yeah. and especially trying to be more open with these guys, because that's something I wasn't always back, sure. especially back then. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, closing thoughts. Uh, wow. <laughs> What what more can be said? It's <laughs> <laughs> great. State faults, you guys. Uh, I, I would stated say, them all. I'll you see you what? then, all or I'll see you another time. You know, coming out. I think uh, next year is a retrospective album. They're going to do their retrospective double live. Yeah, it's yes. going to be an incredible there we thing. Go. That would be good. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, what can I say except I love you all. I'm love glad you. that I've met all of you, you, and love I'm you. glad Thank that you. State Faults is back on this stage. Thank you for being a part yeah. of this tonight and for sharing everything you shared. Thank and you. now the return of State Faults continues yes. Yes. as they play a collection of songs. A live performance is up next. Thanks again, guys. Thank Woo. you. Thank love you.
you're driving through 